there is confusion about the wholehearted Christian. We all desire and claim to be serious with our Christian faith. However, daily observation of many Christians is demonstrate that this is far from the truth. Believers in Christ desire to and indeed claim to be committed to the Lord. But the details of the contents of such commitment are big or frequently lacking. Many lack basic understanding of what faithfulness consists of. Among other things, there are those who see commitment as regular attendance of church services and Christian gatherings. Some see commitment as regular evangelism. Some see organizing Christian meetings as commitment, while some others see regular prayer and fasting as commitment. These things are good. Yes, believers engage in them, and they have their place at the appropriate time. But they are not commitments. While the committed believer may engage in them, they are not themselves the commitment. So it is very important for us to understand God's demand is clear enough. Yes, God demands that his people be wholeheartedly committed to him. And that is what we, shall, we should aspire to be, that is, truly wholehearted believers in Christ. Towards achieving this desire of God, we should endeavor to know what Holy Scripture teaches about commitment, about committed believers in Christ. Thanks be to God that we still live in this time of grace, and He continues to show us mercy. We should not take the compassion and patience of the Lord for granted. Rather, this is the time we must rectify defects in our faith as soon as we discover them. And so the best thing is to do things God's way. Yes, the appropriate way to understand what it is to be a wholehearted Christian is to look at the portrait of one according to Holy Scripture. This is what we shall do now as we can then see where we need to amend our ways, where we need to repaint or paint over in our own portrait. But before you say you are committed, yes, that you are a committed Christian, please let us have a close look at some of the makeup of the wholehearted Christian. So we can then see again where our portrait is lacking or does not meet that level of portrait that the Lord requires. And so the title of our video is The Portrait of the Wholehearted Christian. You see there that beautiful colored bird that is a parrot. One Character trait of parrot is that they repeat what they hear. The wholehearted Christian tries to portray or to repeat the character traits of God because he or she is a child of God. That parrot is reflecting the artistic prowess of God. The believers ought to reflect the artistic portrait or character traits of the Lord. And the Holy Scripture to guide us is as in the book of Psalms, that is Psalm 26, verses 1 to 12. And I read, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. 
For thy loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers, and will not sit with the wicked. I will wash my hands in innocency, so will I compass thy altar, O Lord. That I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving, and tell of all thy wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house, and the place where thy, thy honor dwelleth. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men. In whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in my integrity. Redeem me, and be merciful unto me. Verse 12 My foot standeth in an evil place. In the congregations will I bless the Lord. May the Lord bless his words in our hearts, in Jesus' name. This Psalm 26 is ascribed to David as the author. We remember the story of David. We read in scripture that Saul was anointed, chosen by God, and anointed as the first king of Israel. However, because of unbelief and disobedience, God rejected Saul from being king over Israel. And so God anointed King David over Israel. God chose and anointed David to be king over Israel, while Saul was still physically occupying the throne of Israel, though already rejected by God. And so Saul attempted to destroy David. Yes, Saul made several attempts to kill David, but failed. So Saul was pursuing David to destroy him. David still fought in battle for Saul. David continued to faithfully serve Saul as the king of Israel. Even when twice David had the opportunity to kill Saul and ascend the throne of Israel, David refused to kill Saul. Yes, David refused to sin by killing Saul. David also restrained his followers from killing Saul when they had the opportunity. Saul even acknowledged with tears that David was more righteous than himself. David was determined to never allow the injustice of others to tarnish his own integrity. Believers should always emulate David in this wise. The truth of God and principles derived from the truth of God are not passion to always guide the true Christian. And so we come back to our passage. Verse 1 says, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in thy integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord. Therefore, I shall not slide. Judge me. This was appeal to God to judge or to vindicate the psalmist. Perhaps he had been falsely accused. He thus asked Yahweh, the God of Israel, the righteous judge, to exonerate him. For I have walked in my integrity. He is saying, I have lived blamelessly before you or been innocent. Hence, he was not claiming to be perfect before the Lord. I have trusted also in the Lord. He put his trust in Yahweh, the God of Israel, as his God. I shall, therefore, I shall not slide. I will not waver. He will not waver because he had put his trust 
in the Lord, the feet of the person who trusts in God and works in obedience to him will not sleep but remain well grounded. Psalm 18 verse 36. Also verse 37, I mean Psalm 37 verse 31. On the other hand, the feet of those who walk contrary to God will be planted in slippery places. They will slide into oblivion. Psalm 73 verses 18 to 20. And so it is important for us to recognize the truth that though he identified himself with the faithful rather than the wicked and requested that the Lord tested him, he was not unmindful of his own sins or his need for mercy. Compare that to Psalm 25 verses 6 to 8, also verse 11 of the same psalm. Seeking God's vindication and claiming righteousness of Christ is not an indication that one is unmindful of personal sins. Rather, one approaches God based on compassion and willingness to show mercy to the penitent. There is assurance as the word of God tells us that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just that he would forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the basis by which the believer then approaches God. Verse 2 tells us, Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reign and my heart. Again, the psalmist is asking the Lord to test his action, his thoughts, and intention. Examine, prove, try a virtuous virtually synonymous. They are the ways the Lord tests, defines, and purifies his people. Again, we see this in Psalm 11, verse 5, Psalm 17, verse 3, also Psalm 66, verse 10. God tests, refines, and purifies his children. The child of God is already in faith and has trusted the Lord Jesus Christ with his salvation. Now it is about how committed he is to his new master and new way of life. And so we find that the whole-hearted believer strongly cares to know about his own character so he may not be self-deceived, so he may make the necessary correction, not at whatever cost, um, uh, now at whatever cost. Yes. He does not want to be unpleasantly surprised on the last day. But mark, it, mark you, even without requesting it, God tests his children because he trains them to be own standard. For thy loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in my integrity. He practically recognizes the mercy of God is always aware of the mercy of God. He always had enormous gratitude for the mercy of God, whatever the circumstances may be. He thus has much courage to walk in the truth all the time. Remember, God is absolutely dependable to fulfill his promises, and thus the faithfulness of the Lord is often seen in parallel with his covenant of love. For example, Psalm 25 verse 10. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimony. Psalm 25 verse 10. Verse 4 tells us, I have not sat with vain persons Neither will I go in with dissemblance. The vain person is a deceit, deceitful or worthless person. Compare that to Job 11.11. 11. And these dissemblers are people who, are, who deceitfully hide their true nature. Or they are hypocrites. 
verse 5 continues I have hated the congregation of evil doers and will not sit with the wicked. So it continues again evil doers. The psalmist, because of his loyalty to Yahweh, the God of Israel, kept his distance from those who walk in opposition to God. Thus, he did not walk with four groups of people that are mentioned in these two verses. That is verses 4 and 5. Vain persons, worthless or deceitful people, dissemblers or hypocrites, evildoers and the weak. In other words, is thus like the blessed man of Psalm 1. Verse 6. I will wash my hands in innocency. So will I compass thy altar, O Lord. People wanting to worship in the temple of the Lord must be clean, according to the word of God. Psalm 24, verses 3 to 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who had not lifted up his heart, who had not lifted up his soul unto vanity, or sworn deceitful. That's Psalm 24, verses 4. Hence, the psalmist further dissociated himself from those who are guilty of walking contrary to the Lord. This is what is happening in verse 5, 4 to 5. Verse 7, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving, and tell of thy wondrous works. He wanted to joyfully proclaim the wonderful works of the Lord. He does desire to participate in the public worship of the Lord with joy. Remember, praise frequently consists in continuous remembering and recounting of the past wonderful works of the Lord, especially we see this in the Psalms. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy, all thy marvelous works. Psalm 9, verse 1. There's so, this is so common in the Psalms. I encourage you to read and reflect on Psalm 35, verse 18. Psalm 52, verse 9. And also Psalm 57, verse 9. Verse 8 tells us, Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thy honor dwelleth. He loved the temple of the Lord and proclaimed that love. The place, that is the place of God's honor. The temple of the Lord was where his glory lived in the days of Israel. But we know in these last days, the glory of God dwelt fully in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be conversant with this. Remember, the glory of the Lord is the place of his special presence. And the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ dwelleth the Lord, the God in bodily form, that we have not seen God, but his Son had declared him. That is, the Lord Jesus Christ. Is the one who shows us the glory of God. Verse 9. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men. He continues with his distancing of himself from people who walk contrary to God. And so we see here, these verses 9 to 11, draw a sharp contrast between the wicked who cause much injury and havoc and the innocent who are obedient to God. They amplify the prayer for vindication in verse 1, that is, the desire to be treated differently from the unfaithful. He does not want to be counted among the wicked because he is of God. God himself is the one who has justified him. And so he continues, 
in whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in my integrity, redeem me and be merciful unto me. And so, this is like, again alluding to what he said in verse 45. It's about those who walk contrary to God. He desire to be treated differently from the ungodly. Because once and for all, God has delivered him from the wrath to come upon the ungodly because he has become a child of God and he is no more subject to the wrath of God. So it's like reminding God of who he is in him. My foot standeth in an even place in the congregation. In the congregation will I bless the Lord. So he makes us to understand again his commitment. We see here him saying he is committed to the Lord and whoever is committed to the Lord may be sure of continuing here by the Lord. And so from all of this there are certain things that are worthy to remember. What is worthy to remember? The first thing we need to understand and take to heart is that God vindicates the believer. It is God who exonerates people. Again, this is what we see in verses 1 to 3. When God vindicates a believer, he distinguishes between the faithful and the ungodly. In both the new and the old covenant, the faithful are those who have believed in the Lord and taken the covenant of God to heart. It is not enough to know about the covenant. It is not enough to know about God. There must be commitment. There must be belief. And that belief must be followed by action that demonstrates the faith of God. When accusations are made against believers, it is God who can and does vindicate his children. But the vindication by the Lord does not preclude the believer availing himself of available help or legitimate avenues for redress in specific situations, for example, like matters in the workplace or business space. We need to remember too that. The foundation is the faithfulness of the Lord. God is faithful, or he is faithful to himself, because he alone is constant and consistent. Believers are inconsistent. Believers are fickle-minded, and they believe one thing today, and they are ready to do something. Tomorrow they don't. One moment they are excited, and they are ready to do anything. The next moment again, they are down and heavy, like they are carrying the whole world. So, the believer has no consistent side. So, God cannot be faithful to the believer. God is faithful to himself, and the believer is to be faithful to God. The true believers keep the steadfast love of God in their focus, because they know God is steady, God is constant. God is absolutely dependable. So you keep that steadfast love of God in focus. And you walk in the faithfulness of the Lord. You know that God will carry out his promises. You know that God will defend his own. You know that whatever happens, God will stick to his word. And that is, they live by the revealed grace of the Lord. And what is that? Again, it is the Lord. Yes, the Lord is compassionate. The Lord is gracious. The Lord is slow to anger. The Lord is abounding in loving kindness and in truth. The Lord keeps loving kindness for thousands. He forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. And he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. 
Exodus 34, 6 to 7. And so these are the foundations on which the wholehearted Christian builds his faith. The consistency, the faithfulness, the dependability of God. He knows that even though he himself is not, is not dependable, that he himself is not steady or constant, he has a God who is like a rock upon which he can stand at all times and be held stable and standing. And remember, of course, Jesus Christ is our perfect example. Like everything else concerning our Christian faith, the Lord is our ultimate example to emulate. Jesus Christ perfectly trusted in the Lord God, his Father, without wavering. Even when he was going to Calvary, even when he recognized the level of shame and agony he was going to suffer for the sins of mankind, since he did not contribute to it, he did not flinch, he did not waver, he was steady fast. He said he came that he might believe, find the sheep that was lost and deliver them. And so, the ultimate vindication took place in him. According to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and all true believers in Christ find their vindication in him. Romans 4, 25. Yes. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was Manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. That is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's like a summary of his life here on earth. First Timothy 3 10. Who was delivered for our offenses? and was raised again for our justification. Romans 4, 25, again speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it is to Jesus the believers own everything, including their vindication. And the believers are grateful for all the Lord has done for them. And so, again, it's worth to remember this. The believer expresses Gratitude by a life of commitment to the Lord. Those who truly are of the Lord demonstrate their commitment to the Lord by the general pattern of their life, walking in their integrity, trusting in the Lord without wavering. <clears throat> and so we now come to the pottery of the wholehearted Christian. Remember the portrait is a picture or a drawing or an engraving of a person. Usually shows the face, the, the, the shoulders and you know the upper chest most cases. And so we come to that portrait now of a wholehearted Christian. The portrait of the wholehearted Christian. And the question then is this Who is the wholehearted Christian? The wholehearted Christian is a true believer in Christ who is completely and sincerely devoted, determined, and enthusiastic faith in Christ. Yes. And he demonstrates his faith in God as a daily lifestyle. Mark that. Daily lifestyle of obedience that brings honor and glory to God and benefits to fellow human beings. That's a summary of the wholehearted Christian. Now let's look at a bit of the poetry. We find that the whole hearted Christian has 
faith in God. That don't let that surprise you, because you say, how, is, how can a person be a Christian and not have faith in God? Bear with me. This is a most critical issue that many take for granted, though it is the foundation of all else. Yes, the first thing is that the wholehearted Christian is a true child of God. One cannot say this too frequently enough. The first thing is to be born again. John 3, 3, 5. That is John chapter 3, verse 3 and also verse 5. The person must be born of the Spirit. Become adopted into the family of God through the finished work of Christ on the cross. John chapter 1 verses 12 to 13. This is how one becomes a true child of God and have a true relationship with God. It is this relationship with God <clears throat> now that needs to be cultivated and nurtured through wholehearted devotion to the Lord. Therefore, the Lord is the solid foundation upon which the wholehearted Christian builds everything. Yes, that is, the wholehearted Christian trust Yahweh, the God of his See that again in verse 1. And God's loyal loving kindness and the truth of God that he is faithful. All this we have seen, verse 5 of our passage and verse 3. Please notice that the supports for his integrity are in God and outside of himself. The believer is unstable. It's only God who is stable. The believer is oftentimes unreliable. God is always reliable. God is always absolutely dependable. So the wholehearted Christian does not build things upon himself. He builds things upon the integrity of God. The life that is built on this foundation, that is God, is worthy of our direct, diligent creation. Any foundation outside of God will crumble and be useless in the sight of God. Therefore, a child of God. That's why he said here, a wholehearted Christian has faith in God. I hope you understand that now when we say the wholehearted Christian has faith in God. He builds self upon the dependability of God. And so, the wholehearted Christian desires to be tested by God. That might surprise some of you. Everyone does not want to be tested. But when it comes to the things of God, the child of God has to be tested. The wholehearted Christian has a strong desire to know his true character as seen by God. And this is not out of confidence of being perfect or flawless. Or being so faithful. But God revealing us to ourselves privately helps us to see our flaws, our shortcomings, the areas we are failing, and the things we can do about such things. God revealing us to ourselves comes from realizing that we may give ourselves and that we cannot make up things. But at this time, at this moment in time, when God shows us things, we then can be helped to make those things right at whatever cost. Remember, whether we request it or not, God tests his children. God tests, God refines, and God purifies his children. The child of God is already in faith, as we said in the previous passage and has trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ with his salvation. Now it is about how committed he is to his master and new way of life. 
and so the whole heart hearted Christian strongly. He has to know about his own character so he may not be self-deceived, so he may know how to live to please God and be useful to his fellow human beings. That's the essence of him desiring to be tested. So he may learn and grow in the graces. Yes, make necessary correction along the way at whatever cost as he does not want to be unpleasantly surprised on the last day. He doesn't just want to go to heaven, but he wants to, when he gets to heaven, receive rewards. Yes, again, remember, even without requesting for it, God tests all his children. Yes. The wholehearted Christian believes in God's compassion and mercy. He believes that when he is tested, whatever flaws are found, that God will be made because he belongs to God. So the believer expresses his belief in continuous gratitude and courage to God. Again, this is based upon the goodness and the mercy of God. Remember, the believer identifies himself with the faithful rather than the wicked. He requests that the Lord test him. He should be and is mindful of his own sins or his need for mercy. Again, Psalm 25, verses 6 to 8, verse 11, and verse 18. Psalm 25, 26, verse 11. So, hence, seeking God's vindication and claiming righteousness of Christ is not an indication that one is unmindful of personal sins. Rather, one approaches God based on compassion and willingness of God to show mercy to the penitent. Seeking God's vindication is also not to suggest abandoning any legitimate means of seeking redress when such are available. The wholehearted Christian lives according to the word of God. Yes, the wholehearted Christian has consciousness of the importance of integrity. Integrity is sincere conduct. Integrity speaks of what you do what you think, what you say, when you think you are alone, when you think there are no other believers there, when you think nobody else is seeing you, do you maintain your faithfulness to God? Do you do things only when you are in public, for sure? Only people without integrity, those who are doing eye service at the word of God says, do that. But a person with integrity, whether anybody is there, whether he's alone or with others, things that are lined up with the word of God. Because he knows he's never alone. God is ever watching for him. And so he hates hypocrisy and he despises him. Hence, in verse 3, the psalmist says, I have walked in thy the wholehearted Christian separates himself from the enemy of God. The enemies of God are those who, as a habit, willfully rebel against God. Few of these groups of people are mentioned in our person. Namely, we read of the vain person, those are the worthless or deceitful ones. We read of the dissemblers or the hypocrites, those who deliberately sent a false picture of who they are. We read of the evildoers, also of the wicked. And so, the wholehearted Christian has hatred for all that is ungodly, not just human, but attitudes, acts, thoughts and everything else 
that is ungodly. Hence, he had, as he said, the psalmist says, he had never worshipped with them. That's in verse 4. And expressed his hatred for them in verse 5. And portrayed and prayed not to be gathered with their company. Verse 9. So his total abhorrence of that which is evil. The Bible says that we should flee from every appearance. The wholehearted Christian testifies for God. I'm aware that when people talk of witnessing, they think they talk of carrying the Bible. Yeah, that's good. But how many people realize that witnesses is not, is not just walking around looking for someone to talk to about Christ. Rather, the wholehearted, uh, the wholehearted Christian sees his environment as the arena for witnessing and that he is like a performer on a stage. Therefore, he witnesses by his attitude, he witnesses by his action, by his speech, by the company he keeps, and his whole lifestyle all being done to please his Lord always. And so even sometimes without talking, without even mentioning the name of the Lord, a person's behavior or conduct can attract attention and can cause people to say, why are you different from us? And so the whole hearted Christ testifies for God by his whole being, everything he does. And remember again the word of God, whatsoever you do, you do to the best of your ability. To do as unto the Lord. As far as God is concerned, there is nothing like secular and religious. Wherever the station you find yourself in life, you walk there as serving the Lord. You walk there with your whole ability. That's the whole hearted Christian testifying for the Lord. The wholehearted Christian commits to obeying God always. Yes, the wholehearted Christian delights in public worship of God. The true worship of the true God requires personal preparation, including taking in the word of God regularly, public confession, and it is inspired by the desire demonstrates the love for God. And the psalmist says, I will wash my hands in no sense. And so, again, like the previous uh, item, whatever you are doing, wherever you happen to be, you always focus on the love and the holiness of God, the righteousness of God. You're always asking yourself the question, of how compliant you are the word of God. That presupposes you are conversant with the scripture where you find the reveal, the will and purpose of God. The wholehearted Christian prays to God without ceasing. He praises God as a habit not once in a while, not occasionally, not when he's in company of others. Whether alone, whether with others, he praises God. Praise frequently, again, we said this before, consists in continuously remembering and recounting the past wonderful works of the Lord. Especially, we find a lot of these psalms. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. That's a commitment to praise God without teasing. The wholehearted Christian loves the assembly of fellow believers and praises God with them. Yes, the wholehearted Christian 
determines to walk only with the righteous of the Lord. Yes, he keeps company with true children of God. Remember, he separates from the ungodly. He doesn't separate from the ungodly and stay alone as an island. He separates from the ungodly and then attaches the godly. So he walks with the godly. There is mutual administration, mutual edification, mutual correction, mutual teaching and training, mutual learning going together, which may not be possible alone, but is possible a group of believers working together, being under the rulership of the Holy Spirit, who is the one who applies the incorruptible word of God to the heart of again all this the wholehearted Christian does as a habit not once in a while and he makes efforts to improve upon them every the true child of God has God as his ultimate possession and so he makes effort all the time to please Again, let's have a look at the portrait. Remember, we're talking of painting. One portrait is painting, person. And so, because of all this, the wholehearted Christian will direct efforts towards living a life worthy of God, appreciating his valuable relationship with God. He will cultivate the required traits which we aid him God. Again, in brief, the poetry. A wholehearted Christian has faith in God. He desires to be tested by God. He lives according to the word of God. He separates himself from the enemies of God. He testifies for God. He commits to obeying God always, and he prays to God without. The wholehearted Christian loves the assembly of believers and praises God with them. So please remember this again. Bear in mind, this is just a snapshot of the portrait of the true child of God. It is painted according to Holy Scripture to remind true believers of who they are and how they ought to conduct themselves. Yes, look again into the mirror of the Word of God. And redouble your effort to please God. You have seen the portrait. Remember, you are not left on your own, for you have the Holy Spirit, the incorruptible Word of God, maturing believers around you, in addition to all the graces God has made available to all the students. So, the wholehearted Christian develops and nurtures the habit of pleasing the Lord as a lifelong level. Yes, it's ongoing, continue, consistent and steadily proof. Hence, whenever the wholehearted Christian does, whatever he does, is as unto the Lord, the best of his ability, and without. So what to do? Check yourself now. Are any of these virtues missing in you? Are you a wholehearted believer in the Lord? Please begin to put things right now by resolving to become a wholehearted. I appeal to you. Please make your portrait that of the portrait of the wholehearted Christian. Let us pray.
We will exalt you, O Lord, for you are all our life. Numerous are the things you have done for us, O Lord our God. If we try to proclaim and tell of them, they will be too numerous to Yes, your wonderful deeds water and cause us to thrive, and your thoughts towards us are ever so good all day long. Truly, there is none to compare with you. You have been at work in us both to will and to work for good pleasure. And so, O oh Lord, continue to shower your mercies upon us. And let your loyal love and your faithfulness continue to preserve us. By your grace, may we watch against temptation and resist and overcome the flesh, the world, and the devil. Continue to give us light in our hearts, strength in our bodies, so that we may see what is to be done and what we see may have strength and vigor to accomplish all the days of our life. In Jesus' name. Please note all that have been said concerns believers in Christ alone. They are the ones addressed here. For if you are not yet a believer in Christ, if Christ is not yet your Savior and your Lord, you can be adopted into the family of God. Yes, God has made provision. For here is verdict when he has says all who man them. God says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 Remain, See that more word there, but with big implication. All, there is no exception. Doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter what you think your accomplishment in life is. God says, all that includes have sinned and come short of his glory. And remember, his God makes the decrease. He is a prescriptive God, not a suggestive God. He decreed that the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. And he's aware you cannot save yourself, you or any other person. No human being capable of ransoming himself for herself. And being aware of this, again, while still in our sinful state, God continued to show his love for us. And he demonstrated this love. Let's read two of the passages of Holy Scripture. For God commended his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8 I hope you understand that. While we all remain in our sin, God did not say we should clean up or turn a new leaf. While we were still sinners, He showed His love by making God, uh, Christ to die for our sin. And so He goes further. Having done that, we are told, For God so loved the world, I gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish or have everlasting life. John 3.16 So God, the world, their world, is human being who live in the world. And so he gave his only begotten son. And all people have to do is to believe in him. And those who believe in his son, they will not perish but they will have everlasting. The opposite is those who don't believe, they will perish. They will not have everlasting. I'm encouraging you to choose the right thing, to choose life. And it goes further. Perhaps you're asking, okay, how do I become a child of God? It goes further. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thy heart that God had raised him, from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is God. You believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. 
and you will be saved. Father, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So Romans 10, 9 to 10. So it is explained now why it is so. With the heart man believes, believe things in your heart. And then what you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth. That's process. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10 to 10. It, the invitation is open to all. If you're watching this video now, maybe before you got here, that you have not heard about Jesus Christ, you are trying to look for excuse. From this point forward, you can no more claim ignorance. You cannot say you have never heard about Jesus Christ. And so I'm encouraging you, take up this invitation. Remember, it's whoever. So, you are not exempt and don't exempt yourself. It is the Lord Jesus who is calling you. Now my word, so hear him now. And as you hear the Lord, please, I'm appealing to you. It is the Lord's call now. Jesus is saying to you, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. Please, Please, please do not let this call go by without you answering it. Remember again, a Christless life is a crisis for your head in life, a breakless but far more. I'm appealing to you, you need to get out of that vehicle now. Before it is too late and it crashes headlong into hell. And I pray. May the Lord accept you into his kingdom as you appropriate the finished sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. In Jesus' name.